Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is uh, the week of April. I'm, I'm recording this on April 24th, and it's going to air on the 27th. Uh, so we're at the point where certain states are starting to open up, um, and we still have limited PPE. And so a lot of offices find themselves in these the situation where they want to open or they want to resume things, but Maybe they can't get level three masks. They can't get N95s. They want to keep their team safe. Um, so a lot of a lot of difficult situations. Um, I would go back if I were you and and re-listen to that episode with um, uh, Joseph Grenny from two or three weeks ago about having these conversations and about doing business coming out of COVID. Um, he predicted a lot of what what we're going through right now and gives you specific skills and tools. Um, also, before the interview, I want to share uh, some really specific resources that I've found this week as I've been searching for ways to keep my team safe, ways to get PPE. I've been, I messaged uh, two days ago, I, I messaged probably 40 people um, on, on Facebook that are dentists across the country, people in the industry, trying to see if I could find N95 masks, figure out what other people are doing, uh, level three mask suppliers, uh, face shields, you know, all the things that we're trying to get. Um, and uh, came across something really pretty amazing from a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Zach Almond. Uh, he is a dentist here in Indianapolis. I interviewed him probably, let's see, when was that? In 2019, so June 2019, almost a year ago. Um, and and he actually has, so this is something else, a little, a little shout out to Dr. Almond right here. He has a side hustle um, called Apex Payment Solutions, which is a, a very affordable, um, transparent, uh, like credit card processing. So check out his website, apexpaymentsolutions.com. Legitimately one of the best combinations of software, affordability, transparency. He's really not trying to screw people over like a lot of these uh, credit card processing companies tend to do. Like they tend to basically as much as they can gouge you for, they will. Um, he, he's got a completely different model. So check that out. So anyways, I messaged him. I said, hey, do you do you have access to N95? Do you have access to level threes? What are you doing? And he said, well, um, I've got a lab technician that I'm working with. Um, who's, his name is Nick Windlow. Um, and his email is nick at phaseortho.com. Um, John, John Pratt, he's our uh, podcast producer. John, if you could put that in the show notes, that'd be amazing. Um, Nick at phase, P-H-A-S-E, ortho, O-R-T-H-O dot com. And um, what Nick is doing is he's converted his normally ortho clear aligner lab into a lab that is 3D printing custom frames that go over a normal three-ply mask. So what makes this possible is an app called Bellis 3D Face App. Bellis 3D Face App. So it's going to require an iPhone with a true depth camera, which is the iPhone X and higher. So the X, XS, the Max, XR, the 11, the 11 Pro, the 11 Pro Max. Um, so what, what you do is you download this app and um, the Bellis 3D Face App and it actually allows you to scan your whole face. Like you hold it out at arm's length and you turn, you hold the camera in place and then you turn your head to either side and it captures your, your face and your head and your neck and it stitches it together. It's like a, it's like a Cerex scanner for your face. And obviously this is not micron accurate, but it does actually a, a pretty amazing job of giving you a usable scan of your face um, from one of these cameras with a true depth camera. And you then, um, on, on the face app specifically, they've now added a little button that says mask frame. So you, after you've scanned your face, you click on the mask frame and it will create a custom frame that's fit to your nose and your mouth to go over a mask and you can export it straight from the map, from the app. So as soon as you do that, you, you click mask frame and then you can email it from within the map to nick at phaseortho.com. 
and they will print this frame. So it's it's 30 bucks for a single frame, or if you do three of them, they can like stack them together, um, and it's 75 bucks for three. So you, you'd save five bucks per per frame if you can do at least three. And I think they're they can batch up to eight or seven, six or seven or eight. I don't know. Um, but you can definitely reach out to Nick. Um, and he was super helpful with, through all of this and kind of talked me through it. And in fact, his neighbor uh, works at the hospital, one of the local hospitals here in Indiana, and is on the front lines, like as an ER physician. So he's on the front lines of COVID using this. Because really, the difference between an N95 and a level three mask is the seal. They, they both filter particles um, at the same size and same rate, but a, a three-ply mask does not have a good seal all the way around it. Um, ironically, N95 actually has limitations because if you smile or talk or do certain facial expressions, you will break the seal on an N95 mask. So in some ways, this actually provides just as good, if not a better seal, because it's... Um, it's custom to your face. And the seal is, is going to be pushing on your face um, m- almost more adapted. I, I would say more. I haven't, I haven't gotten mine yet. I'm just in the middle of like scanning and send the, sending this off. I sent it off yesterday. Um, if you want to see what these look like, you can go to bellis3d.com. Um, and then they've got like a, a solution under their solutions. It's how to make a face mask fitter for COVID-19. Um, and then uh, if you want to use Nick as your lab to print it, if you've got your own printer or someone else, you know, totally do that. But but Nick has been really helpful and they've got a good material because how, you know, the material that you print this with um, is going to matter its durability and its its functionality. And 3D printers are not created equal. They've got essentially like the fanciest, most expensive 3D printers in the industry so that's the kind of stuff you want because that's going to give you the resins and the options that you need to make a, a durable, flexible material that's not going to snap on you or break on you um, mid-procedure. So um, just wanted to share that as a resource for those of you who are trying to safely protect your team, see patients, protect yourself from COVID-19, um, and, and allow you to use the resources you have um, more optimally. So um, once again, shout out to Dr. Zach Allman for connecting me with Nick and for for doing this whole workflow. Um, the other thing I'll add is we, we've got some exciting announcements coming up from uh, Lendever. If you missed out on um, the PPP loan, uh, they have a refinance pro- uh, package product that allows you to get cash out, working capital, um, and lower your interest rate potentially um, on your practice. So more coming on that. And um, but if you're interested in that, if you miss the PPP, like this ends up kind of almost being better than than the PPP, um, the complete package deal. So um, I won't talk about it too much quite yet. But uh, reach out to me, message me, or email me Richard at sharedpractices.com. Um, it allows you to get cash out, uh, defer your payments up to six months. Um, refinance and uh, potentially get a lower rate. So pretty good deal. Um, Okay, so we'll now get into this interview. Sorry for the long intro, but I wanted to share some of these resources that I've come across and things that George and and I are are implementing in our practices. Um, And and like George is working with Lendever, he's in the process for uh, to do the this this new refinance product that they have. this is an interview with Alastair McDonald. I love Alastair. He's up there with him, Mark Costas, Kira Dent. Like anytime I talk with them, it's just this download of, of information and helpfulness. And there's such good people. And when you're talking with them, you're like the only person that exists. And, um, and, and you can just, you can tell that they care and that they're sincere. Um, Alistair has a, a new podcast and he talks about that uh, in this episode. So, so go check that out, the Third Rail podcast. And um, But this is from Voices of Dentistry. So this is not in context of COVID-19. This is an older interview, um, but all the principles still apply and the, the leadership and, and the things that are required to lead your practice are still in force today. So please enjoy this interview with Alistair McDonald. 
I have with me today a very special guest. This is Alastair McDonald. Welcome back to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, mate. Thank you. I, I got to hear you at uh, Voices of Dentistry last year, Dental Success Summit. Every time you spoke, I was just like, this is amazing. Uh -huh. you, you came on our show. And so many things that you said made me think, I have to get Alastair back on for this season on leadership, culture, and change. Um, this is like such a nebulous topic. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is, this is the, the biggest like fluff, like just be a better leader, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, and everyone needs to work on this, but, but so many people don't know where to start. So you shared some stories last year about team members and things that you did for them and it engendered loyalty and, and all of these things. Do you know which stories I'm kind of referencing? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That really stuck with me huh. about the way that you cared about and treated your people and how that changed the relationship to you. So do you mind sharing that story that you shared? Yeah, uh, I think I told a couple. One that was clear to me, uh, one that I know I shared that's coming up clearly in my mind was uh, I have a, a young lady that came to work at my vet hospital. So, you know, he and I own a dental practice together. But in my veterinary hospital, this young lady walked in one day and handed in a resume. And she had been like a kennel hand at some uh, practices down in Phoenix. And it moved up to our town. And she just had this brightness about her, yeah. you know. And so she came on board. And in the space of the last three years, she's gone from literally being like a minimum wage kennel person at this other practice to actually being our head anesthesia tech wow. uh, for our, our very complicated surgeries and so forth, and is likely to probably press on and become a veterinarian herself. So, you know, there's probably some judgment about veterinary and dental. I assure you, they're all run by people. Right. Uh, in fact, veterinary business in some ways is a lot harder because your patient can't communicate. Right. Uh, you need to be a radiologist, a hematologist, a, a surgeon, a dentist, a everything. Yeah. You know? But they, uh, anyway, so that, but the business models are very, very similar. Um, so this young lady, uh, I just I was playing the long game with her. And this actually brings up, we have to ask ourselves, what is leadership? Hmm. What is the definition of it? And I think of leadership and power as being intimately connected. Hmm. So we think about the definition of leadership, everyone will have their own. And I think most of the kind of Merriam-Webster ones are not impressive. At least they don't resonate with me. I think of leadership as being, uh, it, it is about creating a vision of a bigger future for someone else. Okay. And through your actions, convincing them that allying with you will get them there. Hmm. So some people that come to work for us don't have a, a bigger vision. They've only ever done this and they only ever think that they have to. Uh, and our opportunity is to kind of pull open the curtain and say, look at all this light out there. There's a ton of other things you could do inside this practice, inside this industry, et cetera. And those are the people we want to be around. Those are the people, the people that are enthusiastic about our futures. And we know this because at high school and college, we had that one teacher mm. that saw you and you, you felt seen. And you, you got good at that grade. You got good at that class. You know, you got good results, yeah. even if you hated it. Well, you, you were willing to put in extra hours because you wanted to please them. Yes. You wanted their approval. Yes. And at its core, they reflect back to you a better version of yourself. So I think I, that's what it is. What you said there, like, you know how our brains will finish a sentence, mid-sentence. You started to say a leader has a vision. And, it, and, and my brain went to like, okay, leader has a vision for the practice, for themselves or, or, or something else. But then you said a vision for someone else. Yes. And, and that right there, I think is the most like unselfish definition of leadership that I've ever heard because usually it's like, okay, we need to come up with the company's vision or, yeah, or, or my life's vision or, you know, what yeah. I want. But you're saying leadership is helping people create a vision for themselves and what they can become and how you're going to help them get Facilitate there. Facilitate that. Yeah. That, that's amazing. That's, that's my job as a boss is to do that. Now, it's important here. There's a fine line where we can project and we can say, you would be great at this. Yeah. Or why don't you just can't yeah. do that? And you see this with consultants. Of course, I am a consultant, but you see this all the time. And they say, oh, what you need is, mm. like, you don't even know me. How dare you? Right. No, you need my 11-step process to get, like, you, you don't even know me. Right. So we've got to be careful that we don't, in the, in the service of service, we don't manipulate. 
Uh, it has to be genuine. And so what happens is people will, they will give you a glimpse of what actually matters. So one of my, one of my standard questions inside of any interview is with a new employee is what do you do for fun? Uh. And to a person, they will get this look on their face and they'll say, well, I do, well, I used to, I don't fill in the blank, you know, or right, I, right. I, I run, well, I don't really run, I used to, but I just, right there, right. right there, you have just reminded them of something that matters to them, and by asking, I have told you that I'm interested in what you, I, I care mm. about what you care about. So, getting to know people in, in a most, like, in a genuine way, so... Ironically, there's a dentist I talked to within the last 24 hours that said, I don't really want to know about my team's life or what they care about until they've been there for a couple of years. That's his loss. Yeah. Yeah. And I, he, will, he won't have them there for a couple of years. And, and he has turnover issues. Yeah, and he's, enough. <laughs> he's, he's burned by people leaving Yeah, and therefore is afraid to in, invest in the people who come. Well, and so he's making it true. Yeah. He's afraid of something and he's making it true. He's not, you know, we know right away whether or not somebody is present, uh, connected, whether or not we're seen. We know yeah. right away. Yeah. We all know what it's like to have a conversation like this and the person going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and looking over and, your shoulder. And this conference is the worst for oh, that. It's the worst, Because yeah. it's like you and I can be talking and like three other podcasters are walking by and waving and yeah. like, you know, doing stuff. And, and the dental pra uh, practice heroes thing right behind you almost fell down mid-interview. <laughs> but that... That's something I've seen in you and in Mark and in Kira that when you interact with people, it's about them. And there's no looking over the shoulder or like yeah. looking at your watch. And, yeah. and that can be sensed instantly. Immediately. And we, we know that it's, it's like anything, it's valuable because it's rare. Right. And nobody really does it. Uh, people don't do it to their patients and they wonder why their case acceptance is crappy. Yeah. They, they don't do it with their spouses and they wonder why their relationship is, doesn't have intimacy or whatever. So I'm jumping around a bit. I'll come back to the story of this young lady. But we, we have to catch ourselves so we're not projecting or trying to impose some vision I have of for you. It's your vision that I look at and say, hey, that actually aligns with mine. Mm. So she joined us. She's a, she was a so kennel wait, hand. I will say, I'm going to interrupt you and I apologize. I will say before we move on from that being present thing, I heard something recently about a study that examined if your cell phone is out, even if you're not on it, you're not looking at it, but it is out and face up or even out and face down, your attention to someone talking is like a little bit divided. Impaired, and yeah. they've showed that. And, and so having like a cell phone away is like something so simple that can allow you to be more present, more yeah. connected with the person in the room right now that you're talking with. So yeah. anyways, sorry, back to this, true. this person. Yeah, we feel it. So seeing the person that's in front of you, and it begins with just an, an interview question, what do you do for fun? Sure. What I've told you is that in this practice, we care about the lives of the people that come here. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a, a, a fairly famous, uh, well, very famous uh, best-selling, New York Times best-selling author and so forth, and he's a talks about relationships and so forth. And I, I used the term, I said, these people are not just investments, they're the most important investments. Mm. And you have to remember that they are selling you their lives yeah. in hourly increments. And this person scoffed and said, oh, that's a little bit dramatic. I said, no, it's not. Right. It's actually not dramatic enough. They are selling you. There are only two things that we have in our life, mate. There's only two. Your time and your attention. Right. That's all you have. Right. And how and where you deploy those two things will define the quality of your life. So that, that someone is choosing to say, in exchange for this many greenbacks, I will give you my time and my attention. Yeah. They're, they're always discounting themselves. And like, that's now my responsibility. Hmm. That now that is an investment that I, they're making in me. Yeah. Uh, so connecting people with their own vision of a bigger future uh, it, it could be outside of work it could be actually I just love doing this I just love doing the schedule yeah. perfect yeah. but I and here's a trippy thing everybody on your team has a creative outlet mm. everybody does it's this, this new podcast that I'm doing but everybody has this uh, you know, you will have a, an assistant who likes gardening or I have a technician that does uh, re remakes uh, like old cabinetry and stuff and paints yeah. it and sells it on Etsy or yeah. you know, whatever. 
Uh, everybody has these things. Mm. And so if they matter to them, how can I, this is, I could rant about this because it actually pisses me off a bit, yeah. is, is this vision, this imposition of vision that docs have all the time. And they say, oh, nobody on the team's getting the vision. The vi That's your vision. Mm. It's not theirs. How dare you think that, there, that the, the outcomes of this vision's attainment are in any way equivalent for them as they are for you. Right. How dare you impose your vision? You can't do that. The best you can do is say, I'm super stoked. This is where I'm going. What are you doing? What are you stoked about? Does it align with this? Does it or doesn't it? No problem. If it doesn't, someone, it does. So as I got off track there, but... Well, I, and it, it brings to mind the time where I saw you and Russell Kirk wrestling on the floor at jujitsu. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so like, th those are the kind of things, like I remember that night being one of the, the funnest nights of yeah, discovering kind of all these things about you and about him and, and <laughs> other people. That, those are the fun things in life. Yes. The things that light people up and to be able to share in that yes, and, and care about that because you care about them. Yes. So th that's beautifully put because we, when we, th this person that, you explained that this, oh, I don't care about the people. It's a fatal flaw. Yeah. And it's a huge, it's actually, a, it's not just a flaw, it's a loss. Yeah. This person's quality of his or her working experience will not be as rich as mine is. It just won't. We find meaning in relationship. Hmm. That's where everybody's meaning in life is. I don't care who you are. Like you want to die and leave a football stadium in your name? <laughs> People are going to sit in that football stadium. Right. People's backsides will be on the park bench with your name on it. It's always people. So if we start there, we don't actually have to go anywhere. Hmm. And business comes to us. So, so the... the uh, uh, got off track again, which I keep doing. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> this there's is just, great. There's this so much great. here. I love though, this. But we, 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 so this, the getting connect with someone. And when I say to you, oh, what do you, what do you do for fun? What do you? And they say, well, I don't. I've told you that I care about what you care about, mm. and I run a practice where we all are trying to bring our best selves to work and our best work to ourselves because it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. The quality of relationships, that the lessons and insights that we can learn about conflict resolution at work are portable to our children sure. and our spouses and vice versa. So the idea of the siloed life, it, 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 everybody pays a price for that. There's no value to yeah. it. Um, so, uh, yeah, this particular lady, she had, um, it was clear to me that she, was, she had this boyfriend who was a deadbeat and nice enough guy, but just unbelievably lazy. Yeah. Clearly lazy. Yeah. She was the dynamo. She was taking care of everything. Was he like playing video games yeah, at home? Exactly. Or something? Like sitting around and like in between jobs all the time and wouldn't even like she would have to get home at a certain time to let the dog out when he's, you know, he's six feet away on the couch oh, just goodness. about. Uh, and so she, she started to get anxious and you could see that she wasn't really thriving because the work environment not getting time to take care of herself because she's taking care of this man child yeah. uh, she's got animals and just she's still young and so I started talking to her I needed an access point and the access point was her dog um, uh, she's got this little beagle and I, I change everybody's animal names I just make up new names for them <laughs> And his real name, I can't remember, but I call him Ramon. <laughs> anyway, so Ramon, I said, I said, you know, what about Ramon's... One weekend she came back and said she took her dog for a hike on Saturday. And she said, oh, I took, I took Ramon out, you know. And uh, what's his name? Chester or something? Anyway, I it's love Ramon. The, why do you change everyone's <laughs> name? No, it's just, it's just something you do. <laughs> I just can't help it. And normally dogs and animals have multiple names. Oh. Like my one dog, her name is Tula and Diesel Mouse. And Diesel, and Diesel Mouse is uh, I've got all t different. Anyway, so she come back to taking the dogs for a dog for a hike, and she was that was like the high point of the weekend. She said, "Oh, it's so great! I got out there, and that's all I needed." And so later on in the day, I said to her, or in the week rather, as the weekend approached, I said, "Hey, um, you know, Ramon really needs more exercise, mm. and so here's what I want you to do: I'll pay you to walk him. You get the Strava app on your phone, yeah, and you." you take him and I'll pay you whatever it was, $10 an hour or something. I mean, it's nominal. Sure. Uh, I'll pay you to take him for a walk and you just have to link your Strava thing with me because I know you're not going to walk alone. Right. And so she said, she's like, great, more money and she gets outside. I was like, this is great. Yeah. She said, are you sure? And I said, yep, it's important. You know, he needs the exercise. He's stuck in the household. <laughs> you know, really, you know, I'm not particularly concerned about Ramon but, uh, and she did. She started walking every weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Next thing, she was walking Tuesdays and Thursdays as well. And she would go home early. She would say, you know, do weekdays count for a walk? And I'm like, well, there's 50%, you know. Right. Uh, Just mess with and it. sure enough, her boyfriend started 
joining her on these walks. Uh, and I told her, don't invite him. Don't mm. invite him. Wait until he says, can, can I, I come? come? Yeah. yeah. Because people, when people feel like they're being left behind, uh, uh, then they'll be like, exactly. Some FOMO. Yeah. Whereas if you just say, uh, hey, hey, you, you know, should come. Really great. Why don't you walk the dog? Because no one wants to be told what no. to do, even by ourselves. Right. Um, so he started. And uh, within the space of, my, I don't know, it became his thing. Mm. And very soon he was the one. He is now an electrician. He was working at McDonald's. He's now doing like an apprenticeship electrician. He's about three months away, I think. I think he's sustainably kept off 40 pounds wow. that he's lost from hiking with the dog four days a week. Uh, and, you know, what did it cost me? A few hundred dollars? Right. Uh, she, she was coming back and reporting about, oh, it was so great. You know, this guy, yeah. I won't say his name, but, you know, he came on a hike with me yeah. this weekend. I was like, oh, amazing. No surprise, you know, an object in motion. And uh, people want to be around people that have got cool things going on. Yeah. Uh, you know, they... I reference this a lot with the, my clients and those guys in DSI. and We think about what is intoxicating for us. What do we want to be around? And this is relevant to docs who are trying to sell the vision. Right. You know, we want to be around people that have got cool stuff going on. Yeah. They're exciting. And what they're, what's exciting is enthusiasm. Mm. And the etymology of enthusiasm is from the Greek word enthos and ism, which is God within. God within. The okay. God within. Okay. So when we fall in love with someone's enthusiasm, we're actually falling in love with the God within. And we see that God within ourselves. That's and cool. that's what we want to be a part of. And I think that that's really what leadership is. You know, you can pull, you can push, or you can lead and they'll follow. Mm. Uh, so this brings me to the other side of leadership, uh, which is power. Well, and I will say with, with that before we move on, I feel like after you told that story last year, you said something to the effect of, she will never leave me. Like in terms of the impact on her life and now her desire to show up and to care and to work and, and yeah. that what that transformation meant for her and her boyfriend yeah. and is, is now uh, that loyalty is something that you couldn't have, have like bought in some other way or incentivized in some other way. Right. You know, you, you kind of tricked her into this in, in yeah. the most delightful way of, of, of looking out for her and what's best for her and and that intervention from you created a lifelong friend and, and momentum momentum loyalty and all of these yeah. things and, and and a ripple effect throughout yeah. all of this and i've told her that when she is ready she started taking night classes now he's got a job he's doing he's actually making good money yeah. uh, it's just radical changes that we this is our privilege as entrepreneurs it's our privilege and we waste it in the service of trying to get things from people to take home more money, whatever right. it is. We waste this magic that's right there. That's what your business is meant to be as a vehicle that, that, that others that of enrichment, that enriches the lives of everybody we touch, not just our bank accounts. So he, he's doing great. They're still together. And I've told her as a standing thing, once she, when she is ready to apply to veterinary school, I will have all five of my docs write recommendation letters mm. for her. Uh, you know, we're going to support her through vet school. We'll have a job here when she comes back, yeah. uh, et cetera, et cetera. We've had similar versions with a young lady who would come and do, when she was in high school, do internships and so forth. She's now at Colorado State University doing a vet degree. Wow. And she's asked if she would keep a spot for me because yours is the practice I want to be at. That's cool. So all of this culture, this... I don't know if we've discussed this in the past, but this is very much a personal philosophy for me. Yeah. Entrepreneurs will talk, dentists will talk about, uh, say, advertising or marketing. And they'll say, oh, I want a three to one ROI on my advertising dollars. You know, it's common sort of stuff. A minimum of three to one, right. five to one, whatever it is. Uh, I have a marketing budget of zero for my practice, which is doubling every 18 months and has done for five years. Nothing amazing about me, but there is about this concept my marketing goal is when I get a patient to ask if they can work here. If a patient says they want to work here, I'm killing it. That's the middle of the bullseye because they are a consistent provider and user of our service. They believe in what we're doing. Yeah. They love where we're going and that they obviously have no problem with the price. They love the team and they see that this is something they want to be a part mm. of. Uh, and we get that about every six to eight weeks. That's amazing. We get amazing. somebody to ask us. Uh, That's amazing. In fact, we have two people working for us that were, that were patients. We're patients. Still are patients. Except now they get free stuff. Right. <laughs> right. So it, it's very much a part of the... the I've, I've done the chase dollars thing, and it didn't feel anywhere near as good as this, you know? So 
because I I've talked with um, marketing people, and something I I do believe in is, you know, the story of a practice comes through if you've got a story, if you've got a cause, if you've got a purpose. Is this is there a central cause behind your veterinary practice that you know you either you know are all about? Or is it this practice of one by one leadership with each of your team members? Like how how do you implement this? Well, it's uh, the funny thing is is people would say, oh, "How do you scale this?" It scales itself hmm. when you create a culture of people that are looking out for each other. And I'll share some specific things that yeah. that, that your listeners can do uh, to bring this humility and this self reinvestment. You create an environment where I'm looking out for you, and you're looking out for him, and so on and so forth. This is the most powerful force in biology, the self-replicating organism. Yeah. You know, this is the water hyacinth that doubles every day. Uh, and so no real, it's just a little, little nudge of the flywheel to keep it turning. That's, that's my only job. Uh, that and hiring well to start with. Right. Uh, because you can, and being too afraid of to getting rid of those or uh, uh, cutting out, you know, cancerous type uh, nodes in your practice. Right. Um, so, yeah, we have a very clear model, certainly with the vet practice, that uh, I, I believe that we're creating the future of veterinary care, which is integrative medicine. Mm. So we have five docs, all five of them are Western-trained docs, two are uh, advanced training in Eastern medicine. Okay. And so we, are, we do everything from acupuncture to high-risk surgery on 21-year-old cats, for example. Holy cow. Uh, we do uh, d- dentistry. We do you know, everything. But we started out, I bought this practice five years ago as this crazy old hippie dude with like long gray hair and like uh, <laughs> Grateful Dead t-shirts and this little tiny 500 square foot cabin. And all he did was acupuncture and Chinese herbs. And I bought it that way because it's easier to add Western medicine to an Eastern modality mm. than vice versa. Uh, and so now we have, uh, th- this, there's now a significantly larger business. And it's because this is where human medicine is going. People want... Everybody has been to see an acupuncturist or a chiropractor or a massage therapist. Yeah. These were historically alternative therapies. Uh, aspirin was in Chinese medicine 2,000 years ago. Right. So, so by combining, we, we've built an integrative practice. So an, an animal will come out of uh, very complicated dental surgery and in recovery have acupuncture needles placed in it for hmm. uh, rapid thing. So we're, we're doing this because this is where human medicine is going. Yeah. And as with our pets so with ourselves so ultimately with our pets uh and that's something that everybody believes in and is excited about so you you do definitely have a a distinguisher from other practices and and purpose and extremely high level of care um and vision that's different but then also layered with that vision of the practice is this this skill of looking at people and what their visions are and what they can become and nurturing that mm. uh, simultaneously to the nurturing of, of the whole practice. And it, it yeah. is, it's not one without the other, it's both. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. We have a young lady, a uh, beautiful young woman, quite literally a very beautiful. She was like a model in Chicago before mm. she came to work for us. And uh, she was working at the competing practice in town. And she's, because she's bright and vivacious and beautiful, and she, they wanted to keep her up front because that's what, but she really wanted to do assisting work mm. and tech work in the back. And they just kept paying her more to stay where she right, was. Right. And she came over and, and met with us and said, you know, like all practices, they work people to death. And she had friends that worked for us and they spoke highly of us. And so she wanted to join us. Came in in the interview, she said, well, this is what she does, but what she really wants to do is that. Mm. And I said, that's great. You can do it here. We'll train you. Yeah. She could have fallen out of her chair. Now she does nothing up front and she's also doing surgery and anesthesia and so okay. forth. And, you know, two years ago, a year and a half ago, she wasn't qualified for it. Mm. So playing the long game with people, we th- there's such a critical flaw in the thinking of business management, in my opinion. And I blame Six Sigma mm. and uh, WH Demings and, and Michael Gerber to an extent. Uh, <laughs> and here's why, is that we, when we... The, the fundamental premise of this iterative improvement yeah. and replacing the—I think Gerber even uses the term—replacing with the least, with the cheapest affordable component. Well, like, I, I love this because I love 
E-Myth and Gerber and systems and, and this idea that you're trying to build this foolproof system where you could just take any high schooler and throw them in yes. there. They're not going to break it. They, you know, yeah. It's going to be a successful engine. It doesn't matter. Just get warm bodies in there. Exactly. Uh, the, ri- the ridiculousness of that, you know, there's, there's, there's so much value to organization and systems. Sure. But to then dehumanize people and say, we're, we're building such a foolproof system that we can just throw anyone in there. Yeah. It is, is it's insulting to everybody. Yeah. It's insulting to the end consumer. It's insulting to the worker. And it's insulting to you that you have debased this human to the extent that they could be replaced by a robot. Mm. There's going to be enough of that in the future. Mm. We don't need to rush to it. Right. Uh, it's, here's why, is that you can have the most bulletproof systems in the world and processes and protocols. And I think we've got some pretty good ones. Sure. Uh, but they will only always and ever be handled by people. Right. This means that people are the transfer mechanism of, of between your vision and your patient's bank accounts. Mm. That's the transfer mechanism, is these people. Do you want the cheapest replaceable component to be handling that incredibly important role? Not at all. It's a huge mistake. Yeah. It's a huge mistake. So seeing them for who they are, and here's why I get to power is you know, if we're going to define leadership, we've, if we talk about leadership, we have to define it. The same is true with power. And when we think of power, we think of leadership, we think of someone with a booming voice whose desk or chair is three inches higher than everyone else's. Right, you know, right. Uh, Corner office. Yeah. Some, you know, and and this, this is really antithetical to true leadership. Uh, there are leaders that, um, as I just told a story of this burgeoning effort of mine. I just told a tale of two leaders and I put it, put it up yesterday. Uh, but uh, what is, so for this is, you're this pointing is new, to your shirt. This is my new podcast. The Third Rail Entrepreneur. Yeah. Tell our listeners what this is about. So the Third Rail Entrepreneur, well, let me wrap this thing up okay, about power okay, and then I'll okay. come back to it. Thank you. Um, the, uh, this, if you, I'll tell you about the podcast and so forth, but I just recorded one yesterday called A Tale of Two Leaders. Okay. And it's actually two iconic Wall Street leaders. And, okay. and I, I compare and contrast two anecdotal and experiential uh, stories that I have. Uh, with them that I both saw or witnessed uh, and talk about two different ways you can go through the world you know one of them is this consumptive use people as tools that type of thing and the other is not uh, and we could see the outcomes as they are but power is also like leadership has this dirty affiliation of okay. of uh, imposition of one's will of uh, control of strength of dominance of these superiority yes yeah yeah but it's a shame because my favorite definition of power is Robert Greene's from his 48 Laws of Power, which is an otherwise forgettable book in my, in my opinion. But, but there is a, his definition, when he starts at it, he defines power as the ability to affect outcomes. That's the greatest definition of power I've ever seen. Because when we see power that way, now I look at my employees and I say, how can I be powerful? Mm. And look at my business, how can I be powerful? How can I affect outcomes? How can I you're my employee, how can I make you powerful? Mm. It's amazing. Yeah. When we think of it any other way, we tend to think, hey, every time you, you get more power, I have less. Right. You know, you light your candle from mine and I'm without. No, I've got just as much light as I had. Same with power. So I want my employees to, to be have- be as powerful to, as possible. To be as powerful as possible. And so here is a trick, for example. I say a trick, I mean, at, at what you can do. Right. When I bring people on, um, I have very few, I, I have a shelf life on my rules okay. in my practice. And the, that shelf life is about 90 to 120 days. And so you join me and you come in as a front desk person. And we've never worked together before, but we get along great. You've got outside interests that matters to me. I'm stoked. You blah, blah, blah. We do background check, whatever we need to do. And you start for the first 90 days, I will give you rules. Hmm. These are rules. This is what we need you to say. And this is what we think. Once you have proven, you know, don't season the meal until you've tried it. I don't want to hear about any changes until you can at least cut the groove. Once you get to day 91, and we're always talking about getting to day 91. I want to get to day 91. You do, but nobody's clear until, you know, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Three months is a long time. You can figure a lot out about a person in oh, 90 yeah. days. So at day 91, your rules become guidelines. Okay. And this is where I say, hey, listen, the, you are here. And we want to get you there. We want to get the ball from here to there. Others who have had this role have had the most success by following this path. Right. 
if in your in your work you discover a better way I want it, you know. I, I want to know about it. Yeah. And so your what are now rules will become guidelines. Mm. That doesn't mean you change them without communicating this and us thrashing it out, because we could have crap ideas, right? Know, bad ideas all the time. There's right. no reason why they wouldn't. Um, but that that's a shift for them, and it's a it's a minor tweak. Uh, and this this gets into where we are in the business cycle and un unemployment rates and so forth. It, it's a small way, just like walking Ramon. Um, it's a small way for me to show you that there is a future version of you that is a creative member of this team. Mm. You're not a cog in the wheel. Which, which also gives purpose to the learning of it in the first 90 days. Yes, now I have an incentive. Mm. Exactly, I'm, I'm kicked in. Well, does everybody get to do this? Yeah. yeah. You see this process? It's called the Sid process because Sid came up with it. Right. Oh, really? Where's Sid? There she goes. She's right. amazing. Right. You know? So now we have gone to the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Self-actualization, collaboration, creativity. Who doesn't want that? So, uh, this, this is fantastic. So, you sit them down and say, I want you to learn. This is, this is the best way from, the, from, from our history that yeah. we've found to get from point A to B. But if you can absolutely learn this in the first 90 days, mm. then on day 91, now you are free to use these as guidelines yes. and experiment and try new things and get, maybe there's a different way to get from A to B that we don't know about and that you see because you've got a different vantage point, you've got different history, you come up with something new. Yes. That, that's incredible and we want that. Yes. Do you sit down at day 90 and say, how, they, how did they do on, on 1 to 90 and, and are they following the, the rules or, or do you sit down with them before then? What do, many, what do you many do? Many times before that. So okay. I try to catch people doing things right okay. and catch them doing it wrong in the moment. There's nothing worse than someone saying, well, last week, Mrs. Jones came in and you're like, wait a second, you've been sitting with this resentment for a week? I feel Let me crappy know. about myself. Yeah, like what else are you withholding? Right. That's a crappy thing. As soon as it happens, hey, Richard, let's have a conversation. Mrs. Smith, blah, blah, blah. Can't do this anymore. It's like, Mid, right away. Yeah. Would that be, you know, midday, mid-procedure, end of the day, you know? That day, yeah, that day. to the extent that we don't shame the person by pulling them out or sure. anything. But otherwise, we'll do very fixed check-ins every 30 days. I typically, for the first few weeks, will, it's really one of the few reasons I have to go down to my practice, yeah. is to, to swing by and check in on people on Friday. And I'll just grab people I haven't spoken to from, hey, let's take a walk, which, by the way, is a magic trick. If you take a walk with your employees, everything is different. Huh. You know, just sit across the desk from them and it's like, just take a walk. Yeah. Walk around the block, come back. They feel seen. And it's the best, the best way to have hard conversations. You want to have a hard conversation. I learned this from an old business partner of mine. You take a walk, everything's different. Hmm. We're not across the table. There is nothing between us. We're both facing the same direction. We're in transition. We're moving. Yeah. We both have the same target. There's a flow. There's... They, it, it's amazing how much easier hard conversations are on a walk. Huh. And, and I, w I can imagine even better than sitting down for lunch. I mean, lunch would be great. Yeah. But a walk that that just, that's how we converse with people we care about. Yes. Is, is on exactly. a walk. Yeah. Going in the same direction together. Yeah. I recommend it every week. Take a walk with your OM. Every week. And just what are we talking about? Don't know. What's coming up for you? Hey, listen. This one thing you did. This is some BS. You've got to stop doing that. You were too harsh on that person. We care about it. Go easy on it. Hmm. Okay. So much easier to hear on a walk than it is now. Listen, right? You no, know, we need to oh, let's, come let's go through our agenda. Right, yeah. right. So, uh, so empowering, really, and I hate to use the term because it's overused, but, sure. but giving people the ability to affect outcomes. Now, of course, they have to produce the results. Right. You can't just wander off the path and say, "I've come up with this great new guideline, and I'm getting toilet results." You know, that's right. not that's not going to cut it. Right. So, the first thing that we talked about was getting to know people, having a vision for them and how we can help them see that and get there as we work alongside together. We talked now about this, uh, I love this beautiful 91 day rule and, and, and the switch to guidelines and walking with people. Is there anything else that you see that either dentists do wrong in terms of leadership, culture, change? I guess, let's go to hiring for a second. Do you, are you feel comfortable talking about how can you find these people that are going to be a good fit for this style of leadership and empowerment versus, um, you know, getting the first person in the door? You know, what guidelines would you give to dentists when they're hiring that they can identify these people that are going to be a good fit for their office? Vitality. Okay. 
Vitality is my favorite quality. They don't have to be effusive and sure, super bubbly. Like, bubbly and stuff. They just have to have a vitality. Mm. They have to have that kind of light, you know, that we all know when we see it. Uh, that's my favorite thing. Of course, it's hard to quantify, but it's a feeling. You're like, oh, this person, they feel right. You know? okay. Do they stand at things? Do they speak ill of their past thing, of their past relationships? Do they... Do they Are they more negative uh, than positive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they have an enthusiasm? Do they... Uh, uh, largely, the best recruits that we have come to us from our current, client, mm. current employees. Uh, and that gathers its own kind of centrifugal force. Momentum. Um, and so we, we're always hiring good people, mm. you know. Uh, and I recommend that to everybody. You should always be hiring good people. You can always say no. You know, you can always say, man, we really want this. But right now we're good. Can we check in with you in 90 days? Right. You'll be amazed how many people can come back. Uh, you know, we'll come back for that. Especially if you have conversations like, what do you care about? You know, what do you do for fun, etc." cetera. Um, as critical to the hiring process is, of course, the firing one. Mm. So... There is uh, a whole training that I do. It doesn't take very long, 20 minutes, and it's called the Measures of Error. Okay. And this is where I give my employees, every single employee, uh, I, I give them the answers to the test. So I say, here's how to suck, and here's how to be great. <laughs> and I want you to be great as much as possible. So these are, here's how, how I will judge your performance, and you can judge mine, and this is how uh, you know my OM will judge you, etc. And it's a simple incredibly simple litmus test of the types of mistakes people make. You can take the most primitive human and they will get it. So in a whiteboard, and I teach this, at, we can talk about it another yeah, time. Yeah, let's but, do another one on this sometime. Um, it, this has been transformative for mm. me because when somebody makes a mistake, I can go right back and say, what do you, which side? It looks like it was this, not that. Done. Right. Done. And uh, we'll talk about it. It's, I mean, I'd love to give it to all of your listeners. It's that would be amazing. Powerful. And, and is it on your show? So tell, yeah, tell us do now. Let's, let's do the plug zone. So this is your chance to tell us uh, what you're excited about right now. I'm excited about uh, my burgeoning podcast. I gave birth to a gender yeah. neutral podcast yesterday morning. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it's it, called The Third Rail Entrepreneur. Is it the first one yesterday? Uh, well, I've got about five or six out there, but they were just uploaded yesterday. Okay. Yeah. This so, is it. Like, yeah, we're yeah. the congratulations. Thank you, mate. It's, it's a Following gen- in your footsteps. Gender neutral podcast. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, so, so what's the purpose? What's the format? You know, what, um, what are you accomplishing with this? Uh, I, I want to just, I want to tell you about it, but I want to come back at some point okay. about letting people go and stuff, just because this is key for your listeners okay. to hear. Um, so thank you. Um, so the third rail entrepreneur is the is the name of the podcast. It's not on iTunes yet because I think they've got to check me out for a couple of weeks. It takes a, it takes I a, think bit. a while. Kira was panicking. Oh when, yeah, yeah, because she would text me like, "What's going on?" There? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it was immediately on Spotify. So nice. it's on Spotify. I don't know where else it'll be, but. Um, my assistant doing all of that stuff. Yeah. Speaking about, this is, this is just how blessed I am in my life and how fortunate I am, the kind of people that I get to work with. So we're messing around with logos and you know, all my taste is in my mouth. I don't yeah. have any qualification. And she's showing me all these different designs. I say, I really like that one, but this one is better. And so this logo on my shirt here, yeah. I, I really liked it. I was yeah. like, that's great, but it doesn't really convey you know, podcast or anything. And I said, but we should keep it anyway. You know, we'd, but we'll buy it from this 99 Designs guy anyway. Yeah. So uh, our plan was to get it all uploaded yesterday. And on Thursday, before I was coming down Thursday night, my assistant comes to my my, off, my house and she takes a bunch of stuff from me and mailings to clients and stuff. And she gives me this wrapped up thing and she says, hey, this is a gift, but you can't open it until tomorrow night. And so we went with a different logo. It's got the mic standard issue. Yeah. You know? And so sure enough, last night I opened this package and it's this T-shirt. Oh. She took this thing, you know. Anyway, this is the kind of people that I'm fortunate That's enough to cool. be around. So Courtney's a phenom, force multiplier in my life. That's sure. so awesome. So the, 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 the third real entrepreneur is uh, about and built off of this premise that has been transformational in my professional and personal life, uh, which is you have your, you go between your work life and your home life. And that's it. These are the two rails that your your life lives on. And at work, you're this. And at home, you're that. And with your friends and so forth. And this can this can make for a, a very shallow, non-creative 
environment. Nothing okay. new happens. The most dangerous thing for us is we get good at stuff, and when we get good, we get familiar. When we get familiar, we get bored. Get when we get bored, we turn into morons. Mm. You know, uh, <laughs> <It's> with, morons. <laughs> with, really, we do, and we disregard the opinions of people. We uh, think we have it figured we think out. We've got it all figured out. Yeah. We do it as parents. We do it as spouses. That's one of my uh, biggest fears as a podcaster too is is to like assume that I know the answers. Oh right. And and there's so much to learn. And every yeah. single interview, I'm like. Oh, I, I didn't know any of that until you said all of it. So yeah. it's amazing. So my philosophy is that you need a third rail. Mm. This this center thing that is uniquely yours, that is not for money and not for love. It's not mm. for your family and friends and it's not for profit or people. It's purely for you. And this is the is the third rail that powers the steam train, that, or the, the engine yeah. that is you. Uh, and this is, a, uh, it can be anything. But it's not going to be, oh, I play tennis. No. Uh-huh. It, it, I have right now three third rails, for example. Uh, the first is my standing old favorite girlfriend, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, which always asks things of me that nothing else will. Right. So I am always a student. You know, I've been training for 20 years, I've had my black belt for many years. I know when I get on the mat, I'm going to look stupid. <laughs> I'm going to look stupid. Someone is going to make me look stupid. I'm going to embarrass myself, um, probably by a 110-pound kindergarten teacher. You right. Know? Um, and that enforced humility that jiu-jitsu gives you, I'm not getting as the dad of my kids True. or as the boss of my businesses. Or So it's this place that I can go, this metal sandbox, in this case, physical and mental sandbox. And I can make things and try things on mm. and lose and win. And the consequences are purely to my ego. Mm. Uh, I also, together with some friends, own and run a theater company. We do Shakespearean productions and stuff. And, uh, and then finally, and most significantly, I'm the I'm the chairman of an international counter wildlife trafficking operation That's right. in West and Central Africa. It's called Chengeta. Right. Uh, if anyone wants to check it out, this is a non-revenue generating interest of mine. Right. Um, C H E N G E T A, Chengeta Wildlife. Anyway, we have we specifically protect ele- African elephant in high risk areas of terrorism and uh, and climate destruction and so forth. So these things expose me to tools, tactics, ideas, risks, opportunities, problems that the other domains don't. Mm. And so I end up being able to create this cross-pollinated experience of things. And what I learn about risk mitigation for one of my private clients, I can immediately deploy to our our trackers that are on the ground in Western Mali, for example, um, and vice versa. And how to run an international board. I'm the chairman of the board. We've got people at, uh, in London, in Amsterdam, in Prague, uh, etc., around the world. Like, how do you keep these people yeah. on, on task? Uh, it makes running practices quite easy in <laughs> comparison, you know, <laughs> because they're all very famous, powerful people. Yeah. And to be brought back to the, the, the board of directors table is a bit of a challenge. Right. Um, so this is what the third rail should be. It should be a source, a wellspring of different ways of uh, new concepts, uh, different philosophies, beliefs, people, contrarian thinking, books you would never read, right. uh, ideas you never would have heard. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping to do with this podcast is to bring some versions of a potential third rail uh, and maybe even be a third rail for some entrepreneurs. And we'll talk about business and profitability and strategies yeah. and tactics, but we'll also talk about little things about, hey, don't do this with your spouse. You right. know, and... Uh, and, uh, you know, here's something really stupid I did this week. Don't be like me, you know. Um, so that's the premise of the show. That's so exciting. That's amazing. Thanks, man. I'm looking well, forward to I'm it. I'm going to subscribe on Spotify. And then once it hits the, the regular one, you know, and by the time this airs, it'll be in, the, in Apple Oh, beautiful. Store, so. Great. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Well, let's wrap this up with uh, firing people. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, as they are wrapped up, so we do. Right. Um, so when we think about how to stimulate creativity, well, actually, let's take that back. When you are not clearly communicating with your team and they don't quite know when they get it right and when they get it wrong, and you and I will will reconnect and I'd love to give your listeners this matrix that I I give to all my private client stuff. It's incredibly valuable. I'd love that. Um, When they don't have a matrix like that that they can fall back on and know when they're on the path and off the path, then people get reprimanded for things they're not clear about Mm. or they are suddenly let go and they don't like, oh, Jack was here yesterday. What happened to him? This is super dangerous. And so many dentists are terrible at this. And what happens is your team ends up feeling like they're living on a trapdoor, 
and it's like, I don't know, man. Jack Any was moment. here yesterday, Boom. and boof, he's gone, you know? And what happened to Jack? I don't know, man. Just keep your... When that happens, you lose the most valuable thing in your team. They are not safe. And if they're not safe, they are not seen. And if they're not seen, they will not contribute. They'll do the bare minimum. They'll just stay in their lane, and they're not going to add any creativity, any collaboration, any ways to say, hey, Doc, I was thinking about the schedule. And I thought, why don't we try? That's never going to happen right. when Jack was let go yesterday, and I don't even know why. Right. So keeping a culture of safety is critical. It's critical. Uh, and this means that we th you give them the answers to the test. Right. So I'll give you an example. I have um, uh, several months back now uh, at the vet practice, not the dental practice, at the vet practice we have the most – powerful and uh, uh, valuable street drugs in, in any medicine. Yeah. You know, we have fentanyl, we have fatal plus, we, the good we have stuff. all that, yeah. And we're also in one of the most rehab dense, uh, you know, towns in the country. Sure. So there is a strong aftermarket for, uh, for what we have. And so consequently, I have very few rules, but one rule is the doors must be locked and the alarm set at night. And so several months back, somebody closed the back door and didn't lock it. And so I found out who it was, had a one-on-one -on -one with them, and I, I had to get together the whole team that didn't know that this had happened because sure. you don't want to shame people. If they lose their dignity, you lose everything. Yeah. True with your spouses too. Um, and uh, I got to them and I said, guys, I want you to remember that there are only a couple of fireable offenses in this practice, and this is one of them. And here's why. Is if our doors, if we're broken into and somebody steals a bottle of fentanyl, we lose our DA license. Right. We lose our DA license. Everybody is looking for a job. Yep. So this is actually, it looks like a small thing and you think I'm being a Nazi. This is an existential risk for everybody. Right. Here. This is everything. Yes. So this is the magic way to cultivate connection and contribution to each other. I don't want, the, I, if you left the back door open, I have to do this because I'm protecting everyone, everyone else. else. I'm protecting everyone. When we do this, we could talk for hours about this stuff. I'm yeah. going, but I love this. When the way that men and women show up in the world is very different, it's just different. It's better or worse, just different. Whereas men, their dominance hierarchy is very important for us. You know, we've got to look a certain way. We've got to be able to, for example, in Zimbabwe, we've got to be able to fight. These mm. guys like to fight. Uh, nowadays, the new version of that is smack talking. You mm. know, my teenage son smack talks with his friends. It's all dominance hierarchy. Right. And that's what they do to establish themselves. My teenage daughter is very different. It's in-group, out-group stuff. And they're brutal. Oh, did you see so-and-so? She's with so-and-so. Oh, the way she was dressed. Or oh, what about her? She ba, ba, ba. I'm in, you're out. You're in, I'm out. Ba, 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 ba. Dentistry is magically, beautifully carried by women. About 90% of all the dental employees, it seems to me, are women. And this is an incredible power that needs to be capitalized on. Because this means that when I go to my team, as true of veterinary as well, but when I go to the dental team or the veterinary team and I say, hey, uh, you've made a mistake. You know, you did something. And I get to say, hey, for example, you're coming in late. Coming in late. I understand you've got things coming up. And I know this has happened a few times in the last week. For me, it doesn't feel good. I need you to stop doing it. But here's what I want to tell you. Whenever you do that, when we say we're going to start at 8 o'clock, it's because we all agree to begin our collaboration at 8 o'clock. That's when we begin. So when you don't show up, Someone else has to pick up the slack. And we can do that for a period of time. We can do it a few times. I mean, it's a beautiful team. Everyone here loves everyone. But I know you would feel resentful if this happened too much. Yeah. And I don't want you to pay that price. Hmm. When you do this, they are reminded that my actions have a cost for those that I purport to care about. Yeah. And you connect them, action, consequence, you know, input, outcome. Uh, behavior consequence and say I don't want you to pay a price right. for this risk it's totally unnecessary cut that out it's not worth it it's not worth it. don't do it that's amazing that's, uh, that's pretty much my whole reprimand is hey come on man come yeah on. hey come on man really that's what <laughs> I reprimand remember you yeah. telling come me on. that before yeah, hey, come on don't come do that on. Um, so how do we fire people did we get to that uh, yeah well the best thing is we could do it on the back end of this training so they know when they're being uh, fired they know when okay uh, and so, oftentimes they'll self-immolate Let's let's save it then. Let's, let's do it. Right. This this was beautiful. I 
Loved this conversation. Thank you, mate. And I, I feel like you conveyed the, the same feelings that I had coming out of, of when I heard you speak about this, I've, I've got today, of just this, this true sense that the most important assets that we have are these people and caring about them and improving their lives is the best thing that we could ever do. And it's good business. Yeah. You know, every practice that is poorly run knows the cost of turnover. There's a visible cost yeah. of, you know, you need your Indeed subscription and your manager's time every sure. week screening people. That's all obvious. The emotional the, cost. The, the, the cost to the culture yeah. is incalculable. It's incalculable. What would the creativity be if you had longevity? What would the collaborative creation look like right. if people had been in the trenches for five years together with new blood coming in additively? Right. You know, uh, it's it's a it's a force multiplier for your practice. Thank you business. so much for all of this. this. Thanks for this having me. This is so me, fun, mate. and we'll have links to your show. Thank you. And and I'm excited to listen. Thanks a lot, mate. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Hey, take care. Okay. Hopefully, you enjoyed that episode. Uh, out of context of COVID-19, but still a ton of useful stuff. I love Alistair McDonald um, and, and absolutely hope to get him back on the show. Go go download his new podcast. Um, I, he's got a Facebook group right now. I will say I have a friend who has a hard time sometimes on his Facebook group just because um, if you are looking to reduce your stress of, of uh, potential crisis and all of the things that are going wrong right now, don't follow Alistair's Facebook group at this point in time. However, if you want a picture of, of how bad things could get, then um, Alistair has a lot of uh, predictions about that. So he has been predicting the market crash and slump for a while and that this COVID-19 is going to be a triggering in a further kind of recession and things going on. Um, so all that being said, whether you're trying to uh, avoid stressful news or embrace possibilities, it, it, you definitely want to make that decision before you, you dive deep on, on his Facebook group right now. Um, but just a, a reminder, if you're interested in, in making those frames, it's the Bellis 3D Face app. And then I used, uh, I'm, I'm working with Nick Windlow, nick at phaseortho.com to get those printed. Uh, a huge shout out to Zach Almond, who uh, has Apex Payment Solutions, something you should definitely check out. Um, in, in the meantime, this is something that could be saving you money moving forward. Um, and then um, on top of all that, uh, George is, is doing a refinance with Lendever. We're going to talk about that in a future episode, and we're going to be putting out some information um, at the front of all of our episodes and on our Facebook group and our email list. But if you're interested in a refinance, product that allows you to take money out of your practice, potentially lower your interest rate, um, and at the same time, defer payments up to six months. All of those things at the same time. Um, pretty amazing package and offering. Email me, richard at sharedpractices.com. Uh, we'll have a link pretty soon uh, directly to that information. Um, but in the meantime, if that's something you're interested in, definitely check that out. Um, and then a, a big shout out to John Pratt. He's our producer of this podcast, has done an amazing job of stepping into this role despite all of uh, three episodes a week and everything we have going on. So thank you to John. And then thank you to Gary, our editor. Uh, we couldn't do any of this without you guys. Uh, we will talk with you next time on the Shared Practices podcast. If you enjoyed this interview between me and Sandy, come listen to the Shared Practices podcast. On season five, we're doing a deep dive on leadership culture, and change, including industry experts like Sandy, but also people who aren't from the dental field. Sometimes you hear the same people over and over and over, and it's nice to get a fresh perspective. If you aren't a practice owner yet and you want to be, go back to season one of our show and we give you a step-by-step -step journey on the path from dental student to successful practice owner. Join us on the Shared Practices podcast.